What's up guys, welcome back to Newswave. Well yesterday, reviews went live for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. This is a big time release from Monolith Soft and Nintendo, and it turns out they may have the Game of the Year contender on their hands, and we'll go over that one here today. Also, we are going to be talking about Sony and why the internet was buzzing about them potentially buying Square Enix. Yeah, that came up again. And we're also going to be talking about a remaster from the 3DS that could be going to the Switch to get a second chance. Guys, if you enjoy these videos, make sure you hit that like button, helps out a ton. And if you're new here to the Spawn Wave channel, make sure you subscribe down below. And we're gonna start today with Nier Automata and an interesting discovery that was made on Reddit that has everyone kind of confused. We can see this posted up. This from Lance McDonald says, someone randomly posted a video on the Nier Automata subreddit showing they found a secret room in the copied city. So far, no one else has worked out how they managed to make this secret door appear. Literally one person on Earth has accessed this room and we are utterly mind blown. And what's interesting is Yasuke Saito even quote tweeted Lance, just said eternal mystery. Now, the thing that's weird about this, they also posted a bit more information with another video showing like inside this door and this room that was discovered. The, the thing that's interesting here is Lance apparently had made the discovery for the final secret last year. The creators of Nier Automata confirmed this. So that's one of the reasons people just aren't sure what exactly is happening here because it's being portrayed as an accident that this person found it. I mean, I guess it could technically be like them faking it and like it being a mod or something, but even modders for Nier Automata have said it's not necessarily the case. So it's, it's a mystery currently. It looks like the subreddit is just scrambling right now trying to figure it out. So we'll see what they come up with. Also, we know that Sony has been making a big push towards PC gaming, mostly with their first party PlayStation games being pushed over, sometimes a year, two, even three years later. Well, with Spider-Man heading there next, uh, next month, the next one it seems is up would probably be Returnal when it comes to a, a new reveal. Otherwise, there's like Last of Us Part 1, uh, Uncharted, Legacy of Thieves, that's still going there. And it appears that Returnal has actually been getting updated in the background. It's currently on SteamDB as Codename Oregon. And you can see some of the updates that were recently spotted just 24 hours ago by Joe over on Reset Era with the one that really caught everyone's attention being Steam Deck controller profile. So yeah, it looks like even some of Sony's games are being developed and updated with the Steam Deck in mind. And I think Returnal, it would do pretty well on PC. And I actually could see it getting announced, we'll say maybe during like that, that September showcase that people are pointing towards, like that's at least when the assumption is now that Sony would have some sort of larger first party show just to set up 2023 and maybe even show off some stuff with God of War as they head into the release for that game in November. But yeah, Sony is full speed ahead right now on PC support. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see Returnal here in the coming months get announced. Oh, and just in case you missed it, Multiverses did release yesterday in open beta and absolutely exploded on different platforms like Steam, Xbox, PlayStation, all this. And in fact, if you take a look here, you can see over on SteamDB with the concurrent player count, it's been absolutely on the rise since it released. I mean, over 140,000 concurrent players immediately. And like I said, it's just been climbing up and up and up. And I mean, the game itself is interesting because obviously of the cast of characters, but even like the concepts and the different mechanics in the game that promotes teamwork has cross progression and all this. And, and you see like Shaggy and Batman on the front there, even like LeBron James is in this game. Yeah, it's a, a bit different there than what we've seen with Smash, but it's free to play. It's an open beta. It's probably worth checking out and see what you think. And guys, with some of the quick news out of the way, let's get into the bigger stuff. Let's start right away with Xenoblade Chronicles 3. I'm very excited for this game. Ready to get lost in another 100 hour plus JRPG from Monolith Soft. While I had some issues with Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it was still an overall enjoyable experience for me. At least 130 to 140 hours there. No sweat. But what about their latest offering? Could they potentially release a game of the year candidate? Well, if we take a look here at Metacritic, currently sitting at an 89, that's on 67 critic reviews. If we take a look at the split, 64 positive, three mixed with actually quite a few perfect scores. I think like the lowest score I saw on here was like a 70 from 
post arcade for the most part it was just positive reviews across the board and a lot of the high points were pretty much expected these vast large worlds of like epic proportions with monolith soft getting a lot out of the switch hardware much like they did with the wii back in the day with xenoblade chronicles you're playing even now the switch on this handheld and it's like this just looks incredible with the kind of world you can explore here the battle system seems to pull quite a bit even from like xenoblade chronicles 1 or definitive edition as a lot of us are playing it now rather than pulling from xenoblade chronicles 2 which i had my issues with the blade system and the gotcha mechanic for finding uh, your different blades and all that seems like at least that part's kind of out of the way and more or less you are pushed towards doing side quests and things off the off the beaten path there so that you can accrue more uh, party members and, and the hero characters and all of this. And the thing that I was really happy to see is it looks like Monolith Soft's kind of flexing their muscle a bit when it comes to the tech side of things. See, because Digital Foundry had a deep dive on this game and found that it looks much better than Xenoblade Chronicles 2. In fact, despite it having like the same internal resolution at times, which was talked about it even like 540p. The way that they're doing this with upsampling and it seems almost like they have their own kind of, I don't wanna say super resolution, but upscaling techniques that makes the image look way cleaner to the eye when you're playing it, especially in handheld mode, which funny enough, is what I said the biggest problem was with Xenoblade Chronicles 2. If you're playing that in handheld mode, your characters don't even have faces half the time. Now the frame rate still capped at 30 FPS, which is kind of expected for a large RPG like this in terms of its overall size. Going from 30 to 60 for an RPG like this, probably not like the biggest thing when they can do more with say the visual style or just how large they can make uh, these worlds. Now they did mention also pop in, which is kind of expected there, but for the most part, it is just a much better overall visual experience than Xenoblade Chronicles 2. And that was, I think, one of the biggest places that we could see Monolith Soft improve in. And it was also brought up the idea of, oh, they, they, they're running support and helping out with uh, Breath of the Wild 2. And we're seeing how sharp Xenoblade Chronicles 3 looks. Does make you wonder a bit about that game. But I'm all in for Xenoblade Chronicles 3. It's going to take a while because I saw many reviewers mention 100 hour 120 hour one said that they did a completionist run 150 hours so you're getting your money's worth here if you're a fan of jrpgs especially the kind that monolith soft put out which are pretty hard to find anywhere else with the style for the battle system and like i said the large epic worlds to explore there and Obviously now it's me brought up the idea of it being up there in game of the year contention as it is one of the higher reviewed games across the year. And while there are still many other games to come out as we get towards the game awards and all this, hey, I wouldn't be shocked to see Xenoblade Chronicles 3 in there. And in fact, it being a JRPG would be pretty cool to see it up there for the variety and all of this. So, hey, I'm on board picking Xenoblade Chronicles 3 up day one this Friday and probably playing it for the rest of the year. It's gonna take a while to get through. Next up, let's talk about PlayStation VR 2 as Sony did have another blog post update for it. And this seems to be their strategy right now, just kind of put out little bits of information as they've gone through this year. I guess until they get to a position where they can do one big grand blowout reveal with pricing and, and release date and all this. But we can see some of the blog posts where they go over see-through view. It allows you, as it's as it sounds, you can see through the headset using the cameras on the on the outside of it, which would then let you just kind of see the room and pick things up and like your like the controllers and all this, right? Not for recording, however. They're very specific to mention that one that the headset won't just be recording maybe when you have it down or when you're just using it there. Um, they also mention you can kind of set boundaries this way as well. And they show a nice little video of that happening where you can essentially put down these blue blocks to show the VR headset where you want to be stopped. That way you don't accidentally punch your TV or maybe trip over your uh, your couch or run into a table or something there. And they also show off kind of a broadcast mode, which if you have like the, the camera, the PS5 HD camera hooked up, you can 
play VR broadcasted with you kind of in the bottom right it looks like there and kind of stream that out to everyone to see and they also talk about VR mode with the 360 view in a virtual environment and the content being displayed at 4000 by 2040 HDR video format and then they talk about cinematic mode which is uh, if you have a headset now it's basically like oh you can sit in a theater kind of in cinema screen and just watch content that's not VR this they say is 1920 by 1080 with HDR video at 24 or 60 Hertz and also 120 Hertz frame rate so that's great to have these features revealed I think most of us now are just waiting to see what the price is gonna be on this thing because that might be a little difficult for Sony right now considering we're seeing VR headsets actually go up in price. This was announced yesterday. Take a look. This is over on Twitter from Meta saying in order to continue investing in moving the VR industry forward for the long term, we are adjusting the price of MetaQuest 2 headsets to $400 for the 128 gigabyte and $500 for the 256 gigabyte. That's starting August first. Basically, they're going up $100 each. So if you've been thinking about getting a Quest 2, you might want to move on that soon because in just a few days, it's, uh, well, it's going to be $100 more, which, like I said, it puts the PlayStation VR 2 in a very strange position because I think it's going to be a more expensive headset than the Quest 2. I wouldn't be shocked if the VR 2 headset for Sony is $500 to $600, especially now after seeing that. And that's that's kind of tough, like to sell people who aren't already invested in VR and convince them that they need to spend basically the same amount or even more than what they spent on the console itself that's going to run the thing. But maybe that's what they're holding out for with that the showcase that a lot of people are expecting in like September or just fourth quarter of this year, that they would have a lot of games to put next to it. As they mentioned, they will have many, many things to show us here in the coming months when it comes to what you're going to be playing on this headset. And that is what it comes down to and what should sell you on it overall, not necessarily see-through mode or, or or broadcast mode or anything no no what are we going to be playing on it so i guess we'll find out more about this as we get closer towards the end of the year and sony's ready to talk next up let's talk about sony and apparently how they could be buying square enix here at any point at least that's what was being said online yesterday and i took a look at where all this was coming from and uh well let, let's just take a look here this was over on gamesindustry.biz and the, the headlines, yeah, Square Enix's Western Studios were a train wreck in slow motion. Now, this was an interview from James here, uh, editor-in-chief over GamesIndustry.biz, with Eidos Montreal founder uh, Stefan. And in this, he talks about a lot of the issues that went on after Square had purchased Eidos, and specifically the expectations, the miscommunication behind the scene, all this. I mean, there was some pretty cool stuff that was talked about here in terms of behind the scenes, but didn't exactly paint the best picture when it came to organization between uh, Square Enix, uh, their London office here, apparently that was working to run with Eidos Montreal. But the thing that got everyone really talking about the idea that Sony may be moving in on, on an acquisition with Square here is uh, what Stefan said about that uh, the deal between Square and Embracer and how the price seemed pretty low overall considering it was like a thousand employees, multiple studios, and a ton of intellectual properties. It says, if I read between the lines, Square Enix Japan was not as committed as we hoped initially. And there are rumors, obviously, that with all these activities of mergers and acquisitions that Sony would really like to have Square Enix within their wheelhouse. I heard rumors that Sony said they're really interested in Square Enix Tokyo, but not the rest. So I think Square Enix CEO uh, Masuda Sun put it like a garage sale. And that at least was one conclusion that many people came to after they saw that low price with Tomb Raider being one of the big intellectual properties that changed hands along with, like I said, a thousand employees, a large workforce there, Crystal Dynamics even. So when you see that, you go, okay, what's Square's end game here? Do they really just want to get rid of all of that stuff just to cut expenses? Or is there more to it? The idea, though, that Sony would be interested in Square without those Western studios, I mean, it does make a lot of sense. The thing I will point out, though, is that Stefan left Eidos Montreal, or yeah, Eidos Montreal in 2013. So he hasn't been there in a long time. It's not like he was there when the deal was going down between Embracer and he's like, well, this is what happened. This is why. 
even he was kind of like talking back and forth to different people. It sounds like as this deal was going on and in his mind heard the rumors and kind of speculated a bit like well, the rest of us did. That said, I wouldn't necessarily count out the idea that Sony could come in and buy Square Enix. I wouldn't be shocked if one day we all woke up and there was a press release. Yeah, yeah, Sony has acquired or at least has committed to acquiring Square Enix. There's still a lot that has to be done between Embracer and Square with those Western studios before we could probably hear about what's next in idea of Square potentially selling to Sony. And then obviously the, the whole thing around HD2D, Team Asana, what happens there? Because they've been on an absolute roll right now uh, with the Switch. But as of now, it's still just speculation and people trying to figure out why Square sold uh, Eidos Montreal, Crystal Dynamics, and a whole basket of intellectual properties for what feels like, as they say, a garage sale price of $300 million. And in our last bit of news, let's talk about a story that many, many people were asking me about, and that's the idea that Kid Icarus Uprising could be getting remastered and moved to the Switch. Let's take a look here. This is over on Zippo Speaks Blogspot, saying you'll be happy to hear that a full remaster of the game is in development at Bandai Namco. There will be a new, much more accessible control scheme, and the visuals are getting a much-needed boost. That's a shame. I figured they would just make us use one Joy-Con and sell us, like, a the mini table grip thing again. No. Uh, they did say there's just one snag. However, the game's multiplayer mode will return, but will reportedly be running on <laughs> Pamco's legendarily awful netcode. That sounds... That actually sounds disappointing enough to be true. You know, I, I would have no problem with Kickers Uprising coming over, even if it's like a basic remaster. I guess technically they could rework some assets, even replace some and make it look better on the Switch. But really that game getting left on the 3DS with that control scheme is an absolute travesty. Like that would be great to see it come over, even with the terrible online, which who knows, maybe, they, maybe things would change there. Do I think this could happen? I mean... Yeah, why not? I, I don't know if there's anything there that necessarily says it's absolutely a thing other than Zippo putting the rumor out there, but I'd be all for it, and i say get more and more 3DS games that you can and move them over to the Switch. Why not? They've already kind of started to run out of Wii U games, minus Xenoblade Chronicles X, I guess, so why not get more and more stuff from the 3DS and make it look really nice and move it to the Switch? Also, who knows? Might be a good way for them to test the waters to see if Pit could have a sequel, another game after Kid Icarus Uprising. What's, uh, what's Sakurai up to? And before we go to the comment of the day, we're gonna take a look at the poll that I posted up yesterday, where I ask, the reviews are in for Xenoblade Chronicles 3, sitting at an 89 on Metacritic. Are you picking it up? Look at that, 28% said yes, I'm gra gonna grab it ASAP. 28% said yes, but maybe later if there's a sale. And then 44% said no, I'm not interested. It is a pretty serious commitment. It's, it's going to be over 100 hours. You want to see the entire story, most likely. Uh, but I did have a lot of people ask, do you need to play the older Xenoblade Chronicle ga Chronicles games to get into this one? And according to many of the reviewers, you don't. Like, you can jump into this. The story will stand on its own. There are just going to be certain things in the game that are obviously going to call back to knowledge of the previous titles. But it sounds like if you don't want to go through the... Hundreds of hours it'll probably take you to go through one, two, Torna. You can just jump into three and see what you think of it. And we'll finish up with the comment of the day as you're seeing here. This is from Stan saying, leaks may be harder to trace because more people are working from home. You can't be sure the employee locked their screen when they are away from their computer. This is not something IT can fix, only management. They need to compartmentalize information. You know, I I did wonder a bit about this one because it does seem like recently, especially more and more leaks have been getting out there. And yeah, work from home, remote work has probably had something to do with that. And it made me wonder a bit about Sony's acquisition of Haven Studios with Jade Raymond as they really talked heavily about development in the cloud and the cloud computing they've been using and the security and all this. It makes me wonder if maybe Sony did that kind of an investment and acquisition more or less for the back end of their development that, yeah, could in some way work to circumvent different leaks, especially if it just improves overall security and workflow. But yeah, you're right. 
things have definitely picked up a bit when it comes to the leak side of things, especially when a lot of this remote work stuff has started. And ladies and gentlemen, that's gonna do it here for Newswave. If you enjoyed this video, guys, hit that like button. If not, hit the dislike. Leave comments down below about everything we talked about here today were Xenoblade Chronicles 3 review scores. What'd you think of them? And are you picking up the game this Friday? And then also, what about the idea of Sony actually buying Square Enix? And then Kid Icarus Uprising. Would you like to see that game remastered and ported to the Switch? Thanks guys for watching and I'll see you next time.